pianist and composer, interpreter, Marion McPartland. But more than that, uh, author, educator, broadcaster, bon vivant. Marion and the cheerful sound of the Upper Manhattan Medical Group, a composition by Billy Strayhorn, dedicated to the medical staff that surrounded him. Marion McPartland, I know you're there. Good morning. Yeah, how are you, Lee? Fine, thank you. It's good. It's a privilege to have you on the line. Thank you. I'm clutching in my hand here, uh, warm from last year off. I've been rereading it off and on. Your book, All in Good Time, published by Oxford University Press, with all those marvelous reminiscences and uh, essays and character sketches. How did you uh, get involved in the first place in writing this? Uh, Weren't you in Paris somewhere when the germ of it began? It's funny you should think of that. I think I did a, a piece about a, um, a jazz festival, Sal Playel of Downbeat. Um, it was probably in 1949 or something like that. And I don't know why I, I did it. I think, um, um, or I guess because I happened to be there and... Uh, I was grass enough to volunteer. I dug that piece out the other day. My God, I haven't thought about that for years. Who was editing Downbeat at the time? Do you recall? Was it Jack Tracy? It was before Jack Tracy. Oh, before Jack Tracy, yes. I think who it was. Oh, my. It could have been uh, Leonard and others involved with that. Leonard Feather. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't Leonard, but I'll think I'll think of it in a minute or two. But uh, I will too, about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't call. It's getting close <laughs> to that now. Yes, well, as a fact, this is a this is a treasure of a book, uh, and I don't mean to uh, you know uh, butter you, but uh, you certainly it's very difficult, I think, for musicians to express exactly you know in terms other than notes on pages. Uh, in English language or whatever, uh, what really goes on on the stand, behind the stand, and uh, there you are cataloging the scene. Well, For some of it, some of it. I mean, it's it. Uh, uh, I was there, and it was fun to write about the Hickory House, for example. I mean, that just started out as as liner notes to a to an album, and. Uh, it seemed to, to turn itself into a into a little article about the Hickory House. Um, well, there was so much that happened there. It was very easy to write, actually. I remember seeing you there, and you and I didn't know each other, but uh, the traffic at the Hickory House, as far as people were concerned, who would sit in with you and who would uh, drop in on a given evening? We were on 52nd Street aren't we? Going back to the Hickory House. Second Street and uh, Seventh Avenue. Yes. And um, well, Duke Ellington would come in quite often because he was, uh, he liked the food there and, and, and his press agent, Joe Morgan, was also the press agent for the Hickory House. And so um, A very literate guy. So he came often and uh, uh, Billy Strayhorn was the, actually that's where I met Billy. He used to come in too and sit at the bar. Oh, and what a remarkable person he was! You, you had a chance to observe Billy Strayhorn. We, we just um, played your performance and programmed your performance on UMMG. What were your observations of Billy? As you, I don't know. I think uh, I don't think I was. Um, um, I was sort of sort of in awe of all of them at that time. I wasn't. I don't think I was really doing too much observing. I was m more try trying to learn some of the music and uh, tr try it on him while he was sitting there. And, but he was such a kind guy that he never ever uh, did anything but encourage me, which was probably just as well, as a matter of fact. Aren't you being a little modest? Well, I don't know. I was, But anyway, I remember l learning Lush Life at that time and... Uh, Another lovely tune of his, Chelsea Bridge, and um, oh, a lot of tunes. But uh, what do you think his contributions are to uh, to to music? I uh, in terms of the artistry, uh, in in 
terms of the compositions that he wrote. Uh, I don't know. I feel as if perhaps he's being appreciated more now than he was years ago. It, see, it seems as if suddenly people are playing more of his music. Um, and uh, there are so many songs of his that, that uh, haven't seen the light of day until recent years. Like, I never heard Isfahan before, although I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was played by the band, but I never, I never really heard it as a vehicle for, for jazz piano until I heard Jimmy Rolls play it. And um, now that has become a piece that a lot of us play, a lot of people found it. A nice tune to work, work on, and oh, there are just so many of them. Like the one you just played, that's kind of it's kind of a hard tune actually, but it's um, it's fun. Um, well, it, it's it has a, a tremendous uh, resiliency and bounce. Uh, it the, does. Uh, the way you and Jerry and Steve Lespina, Joey Barron, uh, uh, mold it and put it together. Yeah, yeah. When you were Margaret uh, Marion Turner in Bromley. <laughs> uh, I know you were listening to jazz, but did you ever want to come to this country and, and participate uh, to the degree that you made your commitment? Oh, I never never realized such a thing would happen. I, I really didn't. I guess everything that happened uh, was not so much a result of me deciding what I wanted to do rather than just sort of <laughs> going with the flow and things happening. Um, you know, on account of the war, World War Two, I got into um, uh, USO camp shows, and probably if it hadn't been for that, I might never have gone over to Belgium and played for the uh, American troops, or never met Jimmy and got married there, and you know things. But as it happens, things did work out that way, and I. Um, when I did come over here, I guess I thought probably I was going to play in Jimmy's group, and I did for a long time, but I, I didn't really have any great ambition to do anything else. Well, then, I, no, then I guess I started to get some ambition, and um, after a while, and Jimmy sort of created a monster by keep saying, oh, you should have your own group, you should have your own group. And, and uh, he re really helped me to get it. He really did a great deal towards getting me started with the trio. And Jimmy has uh, not been recognized as much as he should be to this day. Probably not. Oh, my. Well, Marion, um, in your book, uh, All in Good Time, you, you write the untold story of the international sweethearts of rhythm. Yes. And uh, it has some roots in this part of the country, uh, Percy Hughes and his wife Judy Perkins. Judy was uh, uh, a part of that organization, the Sweet Arts of Rhythm, on a short term. And you might just, uh, for those of us who don't know much about the International Sweet Arts of Rhythm, uh, report a little bit of what you uncovered in in that chapter. Well. I guess it started out when I was, funnily enough, in Washington, D.C., and a, I met a, a, a man there named Ted Cron, C-R-O-N, Ted Cron, and he started talking to me and saying, you know, uh, oh, I guess I was trying to do research on women musicians at that time. I was working on what I thought was going to be some other kind of a book, and he said, uh, you really ought to call up my sister. She was part of a band called the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. And I had vaguely heard about them because they were in USO camp shows too at one time. Anyway, I did call this this woman. Her name is Roz, Rosalind Cron, and she was a member of the band. She played clarinet and sax in the band. And in talking to her, I became so fascinated and she started giving me the addresses and phone numbers of other, other band members, and I started calling them and talking to them, and I gradually got this huge mass of information about them, and um, uh, which uh, finally resulted in this 
in this article, but before the article, no, let's see. No, the article was finished when we went to Kansas City. We played the the um, women's festival in, in Kansas City, and we invited all of the women in the sweethearts that we could find to come to Kansas City and be honored there at the Women's Jazz Festival. And so many of them came. It was like a happening. They hadn't seen each other for about 35 or 40 years. And I mean, these were women. They were Some of them were white. There were, there were a lot of black women. There were a couple of Chinese, all really a, a, a mixed group. And it was incredible to think of these girls playing one-nighters all through the South and and barnstorming and living the way they did. Well, I just can't tell it on the phone. It's just too too fascinating and too complex. Well, we're going to suggest that people turn to uh, page 137 in the 12th uh, section of your book, All in Good Time, Marion. And certainly the International Sweethearts of Rhythm were the vanguard of what would be called affirmative action, in a sense. I suppose so. Well, you know, in doing research, Lay, I discovered that there were lots of of women's bands, and there were and there were uh, many w- uh, women playing. It was just um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of them, like Ada Leonard and Phil Spitalny, and some of the women who played in, for instance, Phil Spitalny's band were later with the Sweethearts. I mean, they kept crossing and crisscrossing in other bands, and, and uh, a, a lot of them made some little movie movie shorts. I forget what they call them. They called them soundies yes. in those days. And uh, a lot of those turned up, and uh, they had recorded, not to any great extent, but they did have some music recorded, and they are re- remarkably good players. Since that time, the, some of their music has come out on on Stash, Stash label, and uh, Rosetta Wright's put out an album. So uh, people are getting more interested in women's music, but particularly in this group, because I think so many of the young girls of today, they had no idea that these women existed and that they were playing and that they really were in the in the vanguard of, of women performers going out and being able to do what they did in, in the face of terrible opposition and, you know, awful racial prejudice and everything else. It was just incredible that they continued as long as they did, which was for years. And decades. Yeah. Marion, uh, I know it's been a long day. You've uh, been uh, coast to coast with Noah Adams on uh, Good Evening, and I know you have a concert at the World Theater tonight at 7.30. I know it's incredible to play two nights in a row in that, in that nice theater. I'm thrilled to death. And that piano. That piano is gorgeous. Ah, uh, glad you like it. Oh, I love it. I love it. I can't well, wait to get at it again. What will we hear, or will it just spontaneously roll off? Oh, <laughs> Probably more of the latter, but uh, uh, I'll do certainly do some of the Billy Strayhorn things, and then um, perhaps a couple of my own tunes and some tried and true standards and some Irving Berlin tunes and uh, oh, just uh, some of those old bebop tunes which are fun to play, like uh, Opry Vav and Steeplechase and Duke Ellington tunes, Cotton Tail and oh. Oh, it sounds like uh, a wonderful smorgasbord. Well, I hope it will be. And I have two very good players coming in from Chicago. Uh, who are your colleagues and teammates? Larry Gray is a bass player. And, um, in fact, I think he might have been with me here last year. The drummer is Rusty Jones, who used to be with um, George Shearing years ago. Yes. Marion, it's always a pleasure to renew and talk with you. Oh, it's you too, Lay. Goodness, we go back a long way, don't we? I think we do. And uh, you just keep good health. And we'll meet you uh, at the World Theater tonight, Sunday, 7.30 in St. Paul, Minnesota. For those of you somewhere in the Red River Valley, the Hogsback Country, and points north, south, east, and west. Marion McPartland, author, composer. (laughs) 
educator, broadcaster, Stop. performing artist, thank you much for all that you do. Oh, thank you for having me on the air. I appreciate it.